Uh, welcome everyone <laughs> to uh, another CPPC seminar, and I'm very uh, glad to introduce our today's speaker, although it looks like that the most of you know him. Um, uh, this is Professor Martin Slot uh, from University of Southern Denmark. Now, uh, Martin got his PhD at University of Helsinki under the supervision of uh, Kari Enquist. And I was very fortunate to share uh, office with him at some point uh, in, in Helsinki. Uh, and then he did uh, a few postdocs uh, at UC Davis uh, at CERN and University of Geneva before joining his current um, university, uh, where he is, a, he is a full professor now. Uh, Martin is a member of a uh, very quite famous uh, um, center, uh, which which is called the three CP cubed, uh, and he will explain what it is. The abbreviation means, um, and uh, he's uh, he's a, a theoretical cosmologist uh, with uh, many quite exciting and original contributions to the field, including uh, um, uh, one of these. PhD topics on the, you know, he's a co-inventor co of the Corbaton mechanism for the primordial uh, fluctuation during the inflation. Um, and today he will be talking about the Hubble tension and his ideas, how to solve it. Over to you, Matt. Hey, thanks. Yeah, so CP3, first of all, is to, yeah, so I I, I think the, the idea is this C is for cosmology and then it's three Ps for particle physics phenomenology. So that's the that's the simple explanation. Yes, so I'm going to talk about the Hubble tension and why I believe that um, it means that there is new physics at the EV scale and um, why what we call new early dark energy is is a good solution for uh, for that. So this work is based uh, on a long series of papers uh, over the last two or three years, primarily with my former postdoc Florian Niederman and now also with my current postdoc, uh, Juan Cruz and uh, Florian Niederman, who is now in uh, Stockholm. So, um, so the idea is that uh, Lambda CDM is a, is a model that we all know and we believe uh, in the outset very firmly in, right? I mean, it, we are used to think that explains the data very well, right? I mean, and why do we believe that? Well, the, the history is that 10 years ago, uh, we had this concordance, right, between different cosmological measurements. So we had the CMB measurement from WMAP and Planck, and we had the, actually from WMAP at this time. And then we had the BAO measurements and, um, and the supernova measurements. And, we, and if we look at these measurements, they all agree on a flat universe with a non-managing cosmological constant, okay? So basically the only model that could in a simple way, or let's let's say, using Occam's razor, the simplest model that could explain all the data uh, was the Lambda CDM model, and there were no need at this time, of course, to go beyond the simple model as it kind of explained all the data in a super nice way. Okay, so of course we already had a prior for thinking that the universe should be flat from from inflationary models. So to, in order to explain super horizon correlations in the CMB, we kind of understood that we needed inflation to kind of set up these kind of non-causal initial conditions in the CMB. And also inflation predicts a very close to flat universe. So this kind of all fitted with our kind of prior from, from inflation. Now, um, so this has made, led us to kind of have Lambda CDM as a base model, the simplest model using Alcan's race so that explains all the data and has this and leads to this super nice agreement between uh, all the cosmological experimental data. So with this mindset, we are now looking at the data 10 years later today, but now today the agreement is not so good. So, I mean, if we look at this kind of uh, data sets, we see that now there is a kind of two sigma tension between all the data if we want to, um, um, explain the universe with, uh, a flat Lambda CDM model. So we see that the, the CMB and the BAO and the supernova data, they, they, they barely overlap at, at two sigma. And this is not even including um, the local measurement of the, Hubble, of the Hubble rate. This is supernova measurements of the shape of the expansion uh, curve. 
but not uh, the absolute measurement of the expansion rate from shoes. So already before including the absolute measurement of the expansion rate, so the local measurement of the Hubble constant, we already see a kind of less good agreement between the data and the lambda CDM model. Of course, a two sigma tangent is not statistically significant. So at this point, you would just say, okay, I mean, uh, there are some small tensions in the data and, you know, maybe these are statistically statistical fluctuations or you know maybe in the future they could be hinting at something else if you know if these tension grows right um and this is in fact exactly what happened okay so i just put in of course uh, uh, the lambda cdm best fit model with a, a flat prior um, but this is exactly what happened right because when um um, Adam Rees and other people uh, started measuring the, the Hubble rate more and more uh, precisely, and now with a precision of around 2%, it turned out that the local measurements of the Hubble rate is in fact in great tension with the, with the other cosmological measurements, okay? In, in particular, there is this kind of famous uh, picture showing the situation where you have what we call early and late measurements of the universe. So early measurements are like CMB and BAO because they measure the universe uh, around recombination, okay? So what happens is, of course, that uh, the baryons and the, and the photons are in a tightly coupled plasma until the photons decouple around 380,000 years after the Big Bang and after then they freeze stream. So when we measure the CMB and the CMB fluctuations, we actually measure the universe as it was 380,000 years ago with some model, of course, that interpolates the evolution from then until today, okay? So that's why we call BAO and, and, and CMB measurements early measurements, okay? Because they, in fact, measure something in the very early universe with a model, the C Lambda CDM model in this case, to inter interpolate that measurement until today where our telescope is built, of course. Um, and then there's the late measurements, which are, you know, measurements of supernovas in, in the local neighborhood um, up to a, a little more than redshift one. Um, and those, those are local measurements in the sense that they directly infer the, the expansion rate by looking at the supernovas as kind of standard candles and, and looking at the redshift um, as a function of the distance. Um, and that means that when we measure the expansion rate using supernovas, we don't need to have a model to kind of propagate, uh, you know, the, the, the information from, from the supernova to us. It's, 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 very, it's very close to us, so we can directly measure the expansion rate without assuming a model, Un, unlike in the early models where we need the Lambda CDM model to kind of interpret the result of the CMB in terms of a, of a local expansion. So when we when we then look at this, we see that the uh, okay. So this is just a more a, um, it's a more detailed list with more experiments, more updated list. But but the measure the message is the same. When we look at this, we see sorry, we see that the late measurements gives a systematically higher uh, value of the Hubble rate than the early measurements. Okay, so there is some tension between the early and the late measurements of the Hubble rate. Okay. And you can see that some of the experiments, uh, most precise experiments, shows uh, a claimed uh, tension, which is more than five sigma. So indeed, uh, there seems to be some, some issue here. So here's another way of, of showing it. So uh, we have in the orange band, we have the shoes measurement, so the, the measurement of the local expansion rate uh, using supernovas. Um, and in the blue band, we have the measurement using BAOs and in the and and then we have um in the two blue contours or ellipses we have the CMB uh, measurement okay so why are there two ellipses it's, it's because the CMB measurement is split in high L and low L so it's just to show that the high L and the low L actually prefer a little bit different Hubble rate which actually all, already shows you that maybe something happened in the middle of of the CMB epoch uh, here it's split at L800, but it's essentially it shows you that there is a tension between the low L and the high L in the CMB, or meaning that something could have happened 
uh, between when the small scales enter the horizon uh, before recombination and when the large scales uh, insert uh, the horizon after recombination. Okay, so 800 is of course much earlier than recombination, but um, recombination is around L, L of a 200 or something like that. Anyway, so what's going on here? Okay, so again, the orange band is model independent. That's the local supernova measurements. Also the BAO uh, is actually uh, a model independent uh, reconstruction of the Hubble rate. So the only model dependent uh, part here is the CMB, which assumes lambda CDM, okay? As also indicated uh, on the plot. So the idea is that in order to fit um, all the data now, maybe we need to depart from lambda CDM. And if we are going to do so in a successful way to explain all the data, we need to depart from lambda CDM in a way so that we explain the CMB with the higher H naught and a lower sound horizon. As you see on the X axis, I have the sound horizon um, um, at, at recombination. Okay. Um, so, uh, so, so here is the story. So we have this use measurement uh, that gives you a high value of the expansion rate, 73 uh, kilometers per uh, second per megapascal. And then we have the, um, the Planck or the CMB measurements that gives you a, a lower value of the expansion rate. And, and those two measurements are in a five sequence engine. Okay. And so, um, so, this so, so again, to reiterate, this tension between the shoes and the Planck measurement is kind of model dependent. The shoes measurement itself is model independent, but the Planck measurements assume lambda CDM and um, and and um, 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 yeah. So I, I guess that's my point here. Um, that, that that the tension between shoes and and plank is a model dependent uh, tension that assumes lambda CDM. So so what is this telling us? Um, is it systematics? Well, of course it could still be, um, but the shoes. Uh, Collaboration has really honestly been trying to take all proposals of, of suggested systematics very se seriously and, and then, you know, carefully through all proposals of possible systematics and kind of convincingly kind of uh, ruled out uh, most of, I mean, all of the ideas basically that people have been proposed for possible systematics. So there are not no good ideas of what the systematics could be if it's systematics, okay? so. Then it's unknown systematics, but you can of course always say that, right? I mean, if it's unknown, it's unknown. So you can always say, I mean, unknown systematics, uh, but but there are no good ideas for that for what that unknown systematics should be. Um, um, but of course, to completely exclude unknown systematics, you would need an independent measurement uh, using preferable a completely different method that kind of confirms these results from shoes, right? That would be you know the real thing. I mean, Schuess would argue that you already have that. I mean, you have certified measurements, you have the water me measures, you have uh, strong lensing measurements, you have other uh, astrophysical ways of measuring the expansion rate. They all have larger error bars, but they are pointing, as I showed in the figure earlier, they are all pointing systematically to a larger value of H0 when measured locally using astronomy than what we infer from the CDM, okay? So, you know, if it was unknown systematics, Adam Rees would argue that, you know, then all these measurements should kind of distribute themselves, you know, around the CMB mat value with large error bars, but they are all systematically higher than, than the, the, the CMB measurement, okay? Um, but in the end, uh, a systematic, you know, a, a measurement with the same precision as used with a one or 2% error bar using a completely independent method uh, would be what, what is really needed to kind of end this discussion about uh, unknown systematics, right? And there are fortunately uh, things uh, in the coming. Um, in, you know, gravitational waves has been suggested as one way of, uh, of doing this. And there are also other ways of using uh, standard candles independent of supernovas that could get to higher precision with the James Webb telescope and, and all that, which could, um, could kind of put this on an even more firm basis in, in the future. 
So yeah, so so that's that's the point. Independent measurements is needed to settle this dispute dispute in in the community in the end, right? Um, but I think it's it's already very convincing, and and in the end, uh, you know, we should probably take this seriously at least, right? Uh, so could it be the end of Lambda CDM? Yes, I mean, if we take this seriously, I mean, as I mentioned, all the local measurement point systematically to a higher value of the expansion rate than, than the Planck value. And as I said, I mean, we already saw small tensions and anomalies in the CMB. I mean, it's not that CMB was a perfect fit to all the data in the beginning, now after we have reached higher precision in all the cosmological data, okay? And in the end, the Lambda CDM model is just an outcomes ratio model. It's a very simplified, effective, you know, model to explain uh, the data as it was 20 years ago, right? It's a six parameter model. And I don't think anybody kind of expects that this very simple six parameter model should kind of explain the universe and all scales and, 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 um, um, and at, at uh, infinite precision, um, you know? So at some point, I guess most people would expect that we would see departure from the Lambda CD model and, uh, Maybe that's just what we saw, right? So uh, what does that tell us? I mean, so what kind of departure from Lambda CDA model would you need to explain the Hubble tension? And why, in particular, do we believe that the Hubble tension, if taken seriously, is pointing towards new physics at the EV scale, right? That's kind of like the crucial question, right? Why the EV scale? So we have to go back to this picture and remind ourselves that, um, that there are kind of a model dependent statement and a model independent statement, right? There is the model dependent statement that Planck and Schuess are incompatible. That's the statement that assumes Lambda CDM, right? And then there's the model independent statement again, that tells us that in order to fit both BAO and supernovas, which is the model independent statement because we didn't assume Lambda CDM for the fit to BAO or supernova, there is the model independent statement that in order to fit both the supernovas and BAO, you need to lower the sound horizon as you rate, raise H0, okay? So you need to move basically along a curve where the product of H0 uh, or line, you need to move along a straight line where the product of H0 times the sound horizon is constant in, in this plot, right? where we have the sound horizon on the x-axis and H0 uh, on the y-axis, okay? So we need to move uh, from lambda CDM, which is the blue ellipses there, along the green band up to the orange band, okay? That's the idea. So we need to lower the sound horizon while raising uh, H0, okay? When we, in the fit to CMB. So, so that means that we need to modify uh, physics just before recombination because the sound horizon is an integral up till the time of recombination, okay? And it's most sensitive to physics just before recombination, okay? So if we are going to have any hope of lowering the sound horizon, we need to modify physics kind of like just before recombination, okay? And recombination is of course, the energy scale that sets the scale of recombination is of course the EV scale. That's why we need new physics at the EV scale. We need to lower the sound horizon in order to have BAO in agreement with supernovas. So there are many suggestions in the literature where people are trying to solve the Hubble tension with late time uh, physics, like modifying the equation of state of dark energy, or I don't know, late time modified gravity and so on. Those things are not working. And if people are claiming it's working, it's because they are ignoring one of the data sets, CMB, BAO, and supernovas. And I kind of, you know, you know, you can go and explore for yourself, but it's very systematic. If you find a paper that claims to solve the Hubble tension with late time physics, you know, after recombination, it's because they kind of ignored one of these data sets, okay? And there is also an abundant literature that, that, that kind of consistent with the picture I just showed you shows that if you indeed do not exclude one of these data sets, then all of these late time solutions to the Hubble tensions are excluded, okay? So you need to modify physics before recombination. You need to modify physics at DV scale, okay? So what kind of pre-recombination physics could you kind of think about which would solve the Hubble tension? 
Well, you could kind of um, think about um, adding some kind of new matter component before recombination, which will increase the Hubble rate before recombination, and at the same time lower the sound horizon, as you see, because the sound horizon contains the integral of the Hubble rate before recombination inverse in the integral. Okay, so if you increase H before recombination by some new matter component that is active before recombination, omega x here, then uh, you automatically also lower the sound horizon. So the most simple thing we can think of is to add some kind of dark radiation, okay? Dark radiation is, uh, is kind of like extra um, relativistic degrees of freedom is kind of like a very simple, you know, could be sterile, you know, three nodes, I don't know. I, there are many kind of ideas for this uh, and, and it's kind of like a simple, simple thing, okay? Um, so okay, there is a typo here. Uh, it it leads to uh, it leads to an H naught of six, 69 point uh, something, um, not sixty six. That's a typo. Sixty nine. Um, um, but nevertheless, it doesn't resolve the Hubble tension. Um, and the reason is that the effect of uh, relativistic degrees of freedom is kind of spread out over the full uh, uh, CMB spectrum. Heuristically, you can think of it like that because relativistic degrees of freedom, of course, do not, I mean, they have a constant energy density compared to the uh, photon density, right? So the ordinary uh, radiation, okay? So they will basically give a contribution to the CMB, which is kind of like everywhere in the CMB. And that makes it impossible to somehow, since the CMB is already a very, very good fit, uh, the Lambda CDM model is already a very good fit to, to the CMB, you know, having an effect like that, that is kind of if affecting the CMB everywhere is kind of too 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 generic to, to, to be able to solve the Hubble tension, okay? So extra uh, relativistic degrees of freedom or um, dark radiation, if you want, is not going to solve the Hubble tension for you. So that led uh, clever people to um, to suggest a more localized energy injection into the CMB, which would have a kind of less uh, generic and more localized effect on the CMB um, around recombination. And the idea is that you have a kind of early phase of uh, dark energy that then decays. Um, so of course, dark energy will be very suppressed in the early universe, but it will very quickly become important compared to radiation as the universe expands. And just as it kind of makes up like 10% or is about to become important, it decays and becomes unimportant again. So that means it only makes an effect on the CMB just around the point where it was about to become important, but decayed, okay? So these guys then um, um, made this nice model where they, have a, a, an action field, which is kind of like a generic uh, light scalar field you could have in cosmology, right? Which is um, where the field is initially uh, sitting near the top of one of the, of, of the periodic features in the potential. And then as the field becomes light, uh, as the Hubble rate decreases uh, with the expansion of the universe, sorry, as the, the field becomes massive, as the Hubble rate decreases and the mass becomes comparable to the Hubble rate as the universe uh, expands, the, the, the field will start moving in its potential and start oscillating around the minimum. Now, if the, if the field behaves like phi squared around the minimum, it's like non it behaves like non-relativistic dust around the minimum, which does not redshift away fast, okay? In fact, it will start dominating over radiation, okay? If the field is like phi four around the minimum, it will behave like radiation and it will be as bad as the dark radiation, okay? So the field needs to behave like phi to the six, like a kind of relatively stiff fluid, something stiffer than radiation, in order to redshift away fast enough and in fact be a localized feature in the CMB, okay? And, and if you indeed assume a phi to the six potential around the minimum, this model uh, can resolve the Hubble tension and give a, a higher value of H naught and fit the CMB uh, very well, okay? The problem with this model is that you know, it's very non-generic because if you have actions, I mean, they're giving by cosine potential. And if you just expand the mass, uh, the, 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 the potential around the minimum will be a phi squared potential. It will not be a phi six, okay? 
So a, a generic action potential will not give you this, we will not give you this feature. So you need to add several actions and then fine tune their potential against each other to cancel the phi two and the phi four term. It's a little bit like if you take a generic potential and expand it around the Taylor expanded around the minimum, the, the leading terms around the minimum will of course not be the phi six term, right? In order to have the phi six term dominate around the minimum, you need to fine tune away many terms in your Taylor expansion. So it's very unnatural. And furthermore, is, is non-renormalizable, okay? So, so, you know, from a microscopic point of view, this leads to, a, you know, a bunch of, of problems and questions, okay? So this is very non-generic, it's very fine tuned, and it's, you know, not very appealing from a kind of microscopic point of view, okay? So uh, this led us to, to wonder whether, you know, from a microscopic point of view, we could do better, no? Uh, so that led us to, to think about a new early dark energy, which is a different way of trying to achieve some of the same things. Um, and the idea is that, New early dark energy is a fast triggered phase transition in the dark sector, okay? So the idea is that instead of having this kind of um, adiabatic evolution, if you want, where the field is sitting somewhere in its potential and then slow roll uh, towards its minimum and start oscillating, we are triggering the phase transition by some uh, tri triggering mechanism, right? You can, think of a, uh, in, you can think of a part of water um, you know, in Australia, if you leave it on, 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 your, on your terrace or whatever, it will probably evaporate over some time, right? But if you put a flame under it and, and crank up the flame, you know, you will trigger a very fast phase transition, right? And, um, and, 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 and you will, you know, and it will evaporate much faster, right? So that's the idea here, that if you, if you have a tri fast triggered phase transition, you can achieve this uh, uh, naturally in a fast way and have a, this localized feature in the CMB in a natural way. So you could think about um, a first order phase transition that is triggered by indeed temperature, temperature corrections to, to a scalar field potential. Um, so as the temperature drops in the universe, in the dark sector, it triggers a, a, a first order phase transition that will be very rapid, okay? Or you could have a second scalar field that triggers uh, the phase transition a little bit like in, in hybrid inflation, okay? So new early dark energy is really kind of like a framework for understanding the Hubble tension. It can accommodate more kind of microphysical models. And, but the basic idea is you have this fa fast triggered phase transition, okay? So indeed what we call cold new early dark energy is a first order phase transition which is triggered by a scalar field, okay? So it's all in the vacuum, there's no temperature, it's a vacuum phase transition where the triggering is by a second scalar field that makes the first order phase transition very rapid, okay? Then we have the hot new early dark energy model, which is also a first order phase transition, but which is triggered by a temperature in the dark sector. So while the cold new early dark energy where the triggering is by a second scalar field is a vacuum phase transition is much similar to how uh, inflation ends, right? Then the hot new early dark energy model where you have a temperature induced phase transition is much more similar to what you know from electroweak phase transition or QCD phase transition and so on, right? Uh, and then of course, uh, there is a, a, a kind of third class of, of models here that, that I don't want to discuss more here, but which is not a first order phase transition, but which is a, a fast triggered second order phase transition, okay? And, and there is a kind of, um, there is in fact a continuous um, limit where the cold NADE can, uh, you know, becomes very much like uh, this hybrid NADE. Okay, okay so uh, let me explain you uh, what is cold new early dark energy uh, or well, just new early dark energy in general for a start. And then I will come to cold new early dark energy and hot new early dark energy afterwards. Okay, so at the background level, we have a very fast triggered phase transition. So we have an equation of state that goes from minus one to uh, some equation of state omega new early dark energy, okay? At some time T star where the phase transition happens, okay? Um, such a phase transition can affect uh, perturbations in different ways. So that's the phase transition at the background level, but of course we need to treat perturbations consistently, okay? So the perturbations in the cosmological fluids 
uh, kind of feel this phase transition in different ways, okay? So first of all, the phase transition affects the perturbations um, by the change in the, in the effective equation of state, okay? So just the fact that the equation of state changes rapidly at the background level will lead to uh, effects on, on the perturbations. And those effects we will uh, see in the CMB. So we need to kind of uh, track these uh, effects on the perturbations in order to fit the model to, to the CMB. Um, the, 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 the transition or the phase transition also affects the perturbations in a different way, because apart from the fact that the transition happens and changes the equation of state and the perturbations will evolve in a new equation of state that, that, it, that has this uh, rapid change, the transition will also, I mean, happen in slightly different places uh, at, um, um, uh, at, at slightly different times in different places. And that's because that the transition is triggered by a trigger, temperature or a scalar field. And the trigger itself will have perturbations, at least adiabatic perturbations, right? It will inherit the adiabatic perturbations from the other cosmological perturbations, right? And so the trigger will not have the exact same value uh, everywhere. And so um, uh, the trigger will not trigger a phase transition at exactly the same time everywhere. So the trigger itself will induce some perturbations, which will be relevant for the CMB as well. Okay. And so uh, what I'm trying to say here is that we need to track these effects. I mean, we, we need to compute the, the effect of, on, on the perturbations and track these effects in order to properly understand this model and how it fits the CMB, okay? And this is a non-trivial non work of uh, perturbation theory because unlike a phase transition that happens in the early, in the much earlier universe, the QCD or elix weak phase transition or even phase transition in inflation, at that time, all the relevant scales in the CMB are outside the horizon. And to make this kind of matching of perturbations across this kind of phase transition is matching super horizon perturbations across some, some transition, which is kind of trivial, okay? Because super horizon perturbations, adiabatic perturbations are a frozen, um, um, frozen in, right? On the other hand, for the new early dark energy phase transition that happens shortly before recombination, some of the important scales are already inside the horizon, okay? And so to do this match, is, is a much more non-trivial piece of work. And we, you know, uh, we could use the Israel junction condition um, and, 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 and actually do this, okay? But the, the, the bottom line is that the perturbations depend on your choice of trigger, right? Because it depends on the fluctuations of the trigger, uh, the details of the perturbations, okay? But in any way, doing this systematically using the Israel junction conditions and so on, we could implement uh, this treatment, this new treatment, systematically tre systematic treatment of perturbations that encounters a phase transition when they are already sub-horizon, we could, you know, work out this perturbation theory and implement it into a Boltzmann code we call trigger class, which is a modified version of class, so that we can simulate the effect of this kind of new early dark energy phase transition uh, on the CMB. Okay? Uh, and so uh, just to, to summarize the kind of uh, logic here, um, the initial conditions for perturbations after a phase transition depends on the choice of, of the trigger in the way I just described. The trigger will kind of, uh, the way that the, tr the, the fluctuations of the trigger is imprinted uh, in the CMB by not triggering the, the phase transition exactly at the same time everywhere depends on the choice of the trigger. Is it a temperature or is it a scale of as one? Um, and that means that the perturbations uh, depend on the microphysical realization of NED. So we can actually discriminate between different versions of NEDE through uh, perturbation theory, right? Because of course the CMP and isotropies depends on the initial perturbations uh, um, that are initialized by, uh, by, um, uh, by this trigger mechanism, right? And, and that means, again, we can discriminate between the different microphysical models uh, using CMB and last case structure, okay? And so just to make the point clear, cold new early dark energy and hot new early dark energy are not the same models because they have different microphysics. They have diff they're different at the perturbation level. And of course, they are very different from the old early dark energy model, which is a slow non-triggered phase transition in a scalar field, which has completely different perturbations. And we can also see it when we fit to the CMB that 
the fits uh, are, are different, uh, you know, in, in, in measurable ways. Okay. Okay, so cold new early dark energy. Um, the idea is that you have a scalar field that undergo a first order phase transition. So the vacuum energy that describes the early dark energy decays in the first order phase transition, and the free energy is converted into anisotropic stress. Anisotropic stress, the tensor part source is scalar field, and the scalar and the vector paths uh, is becomes uh, it, it decays like a, a, a stiff fluid. Okay. So you have a mixture of radiation and, and stiff fluid. So you have uh, basically at the microscopic level, you have a phase transition that goes from an equation of state minus one naturally to an equation of state with an equation of state that is larger than one third, okay? And that's exactly what we wanted. That was what was unnatural in the old model, okay? Um, so the idea is, uh, is that the fa phase transition to have, have to be fast, because you don't want um, that bubble evolves in the very early universe and becomes very large and leads to very large inhomogeneities. So you need to ensure that this phase transition happens, uh, you know, at the right time and is sufficiently fast in order to make the bubbles very small. So, so to basically nucleate a lot of bubbles at the same time so that they remain small when they start uh, colliding and never become very big, okay? That's, that's the idea. Uh, and so you can, uh, in fact, uh, realize this kind of physics with a renormalizable two, two scalar field model. Okay, so this is just a simple two scalar field model uh, with, uh, you know, renormalizable uh, terms, no mass terms and, and uh, up to lambda 5, 4. Okay. Um, and so uh, the trigger field, uh, so basically the potential is, is pictured here. You have the trigger field direction, which is the phi direction. And then we have the psi direction, which is another, which is the new new early dark energy boson that undergoes the phase transition, right? So, uh, so the phi field is the trigger field. You have a flat direction there. The trigger field, when it becomes light, uh, sorry, when it becomes massive compared to the Hubble rate, will start moving and open up a new vacuum for the NEDE boson that then will undergo uh, instantaneously a first order phase transition and tunnel from the red point to the white point. But um, but earlier on, when we are near the blue point, say uh, the barrier is too high and it blocks the phase transition. Okay, so so basically um, the phase transition only uh, happens once the trigger field becomes massive compared to the operator. Of course, you also need to ensure that you have this very light uh, trigger field. You need to ensure that your potential is radiatively st stable, and you can uh, you can uh, check that uh, it can. It can be uh, technically uh, natural. Okay, there is also uh, many possible UV completions in terms of, in fact, actions, clockwork models, monotony, and so on. And also, uh, for instance, it can be connected, as we also pointed out already in our first paper, to to the landscape, because in the landscape, of course, you would imagine that there are many uh, false va uh, false vectors, and uh, you tunnel between uh, you tunnel many times in the cosmological history between. Uh, different vacuous in the dark sector. Um, and in fact, uh, connected to this, uh, Katie Fries and uh, Gustav Wingler uh, proposed a, a version of this, which they call ch chain uh, neural diagram, uh, which is a kind of way of trying to connect uh, this story to, to something like a simple landscape, right? Okay, so the idea is again here that you start with the field in the, in the false vacuum on the left, and then as the trigger field becomes heavy, you instantaneously, you, you start to nucleate very fastly a lot of uh, true vacuum bubbles that, and, and the phase transition is so fast that these vacuum bubbles start to collide before they become of cosmological scale, okay? So these, this, these vacuum bubbles of the isocurvature perturbation from the, from the existence of these vacuum bubbles will not disturb the CMB, okay? Um, as they collide, um, their free energy is converted into anisotropic stress, as I said, which will partly solve, source gravitational waves, but also uh, other components of it will act as um, um, uh, a stiff fluid, okay? And so you have this mixture of, you know, gravitational radiation and uh, a stiff fluid in terms of the uh, cosmic shear perturbations. Um, 
Uh, but the important point here is that the phase transition is super fast, so we can treat it as an instantaneous process from the point of view of the um, perturbation theory. Uh, and so, um, yeah, so this is a summary of what I just said, right? We have uh, this three-step uh, process of the completion of the, of the phase transition. And as I mentioned, it sources gravitational waves, uh, and so there is a standard, uh, you know, um, there's a, there is a standard way of computing the gravitational wave spectrum from a first order phase transition. Uh, the amplitude depends on the fastness of the phase transition, and the frequency of the peak of the gravitational wave spectrum depends on on the on the time of the phase transition. Okay, so um, so since um, since our phase transition happens very late at the EV scale, uh, the frequency of our gravitational waves will be uh, super, super low, okay? Um, so, um, um, yeah, so, so there is no gravitational wave experiment uh, per se that is designed uh, to, to that, that can detect the peak of this uh, super low frequency gravitational wave spectrum. But in fact, the scale array may be able to detect the tail uh, of the fall down uh, towards the high frequencies of the spectrum. Okay, and so we computed um, um, we computed this tail, uh, this fall off tail of the of the spectrum, and compared it to this, you know, predicted scale sensitivity, and and you know, uh, depending on on the fastness of the phase transition. Uh, scale may barely be uh, sensitive to uh, to the gravitational wave spectrum. Okay, so uh, to summarize again here, uh, so in in this case, if you look at the black uh, figure there, now the transition surface in cold NADE is fixed. It's fixed by the constants constancy of the trigger scalar. So it's a it's a surface. The trigger surface is a surface of constant trigger field. Of course, it will fluctuate because the trigger field fluctuates, um, and we can compute all this now. We can put it into to the code and simulate uh, cold NAD and compare to the CV. So again, the phase transition uh, affects the the cold NAD phase, phase transition affects the perturbations in different ways. The perturbations feel the the change in the effective equation of state on the background level that's relevant for the CMB. The transition is triggered at different places at different times due to the fluctuations in the trigger field as I argued, is important for the CMB. But since the bubbles that are produced in the phase transition does not reach cosmological star sizes before they start colliding and, 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 and undergo coalescence, uh, those perturbations generated by the bubbles are irrelevant for the CMB because the scale, the, 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 the length scale of the bubbles is too small for, uh, for, to be relevant in the CMB. Uh, so yeah, we can uh, we can uh, yeah. I mean, we can. Um, yeah, this is just uh, a little bit more on on you know on the on how to to match the perturbation and treat the perturbations. This is a little bit detailed, um, but in the end, I guess the the point of this slide here is that in the in the when we implement this model with the specific trigger into into class and into a Boltzmann code, you know, a modified version of class, uh, then the um, the the effective you know the 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 effective uh, code uh, that treats the perturbations I mean the Boltzmann code that treats the perturbation introduces from cold new early dark energy two new parameters um, in addition to the standard lambda CDM model which is the fraction of early dark energy before the decay of uh, new early dark energy and the mass of the trigger field that fixes the time of the phase transition okay so the time of the phase transition and the fraction of new early dark energy before the phase transition are the kind of two new parameters that enters into fits to CMB, okay? Uh, so does that work when we fit to the CMB using the Boltzmann code and all that? Uh, yes, we had an updated, I mean, we did uh, analysis already uh, two years ago, but here's an updated analysis from uh, just uh, the, from September this year, right? Just last month where we included uh, in addition to Planck and BAO and and with and without shoes, we also included the newest uh, ground-based uh, CMB measurements. So ACT, SPT, SPT, and BICEP. So basically looking at all the relevant cosmological data. 
And we find that kind of independent of the data sets that you include, new early dark energy can fit the CMB better than Lambda CDM when you include shoes with a value on H naught up to the uh, of 72, okay? So in fact, the chi-square improvement is 23. So it's it's uh, it's significant, statistically significantly, you know, better, uh, you know, I mean, fit than Lambda CDM. And in fact, um, it favors um, new early dark energy over Lambda CDM when you include shoes by more than four, four sigma. Okay, so 4.7 sigma, basically. Um, yeah, so so all this, uh, so basically, yes, it can resolve um, essentially the Hubble tension um, if you believe the shoes data, okay? Uh, but this comes uh, at a price because um, this injection, this new early dark energy um, um, injection, if you want, it leads to increased diffusion damping and also a faster decay, decay of the wide gravitational potential, okay? So the, it, there are two effects there. One effect is compensated by a little bit more omega dark matter, which increases, you know, slightly the SA tension if you want, but not in a statistically significant way, it's like by, you know, from, you know, by 0 0.2 sigma or something like that. So it's a very kind of, you know, very little uh, effect. Uh, I will talk more about that when I come to hot NED. Um, but also, so that was the effect of the decaying wild gravitational potential. And then in order to offset um, the diffusion damping, uh, you need a more blue spectrum, okay? So that means that in this, if you take shoes measurement seriously, and uh, the solution to NED, uh, to the Hubble tension by NEDE, it means that uh, Starobinsky inflation is no longer a good fit to the CMB, okay? And instead, uh, you need a model that can accommodate a more blue spectrum. So uh, you need a, a, the simplest version of the curvaton model where you have a quadratic uh, inflation and a quadratic curvaton uh, potential, okay, a mass term for, a mass term for the inflaton and a mass term for the curvaton. So um, we see here um, the, the blue ellipsis here is the Lambda CDM uh, model. And the purple thing is Starobinsky inflation, which fits Lambda CDM as we know. And the blue uh, ellipsis is new early dark energy, including shoes, okay? And you see, you get a much more uh, blue um, spectrum. And this is uh, using BICEP 18. And the, this is of course, now the, the spectral tilt versus, uh, or sorry, the, the tensor to scalar ratio versus the, the spectral tilt of this CMB. Okay? And so uh, in the yellow band, uh, or in the yellow, yellow region, you have the simplest curvaton model, which is just quadratic inflation, so inflation with just a mass term, and then a second scalar uh, field, which is also just a massive scalar field that is subdominant during inflation, but comes to dominate the, uh, or almost, dominate the universe after inflation and then decays, okay? And, and so you see that it's either Lambda CDM or Starobinsky uh, and not shoes because it doesn't fit the shoes data or it's believing in the shoes data, but then disposing of Starobinsky inflation and Lambda CDM and instead have a new early dark entity and, and the curvature model. So here's a comparison between different models that have tried to uh, solve the, the Hubble tension and new early dark energy is really doing uh, the best possible job, okay? Uh, here you see how different models uh, affect perturbations in different ways. So this is just the perturbations in the CMB, the comparison of the CM perturbations in the CMB between different models. And it means that in the future with more precise CMB measurements and large-scale structure measurements, we will in fact be able to discriminate between these different proposals for free recombination, uh, new physics to solve the Hubble tension, okay? Uh, and here is uh, not my comparison of model, but somebody else's comparison of model, so you don't need to trust me for this, okay? Here's the H not Olympics paper, which is by other authors than, than, than us. So this is not biased by our opinion. Uh, and you also see that these guys also find that new early dark energy is really, you know, doing the best possible, okay? Um, I should say that there is this gold medal, you see they are varying, varying the electron mass, okay? 
So phenomenologically, varying the electron mass uh, did very well in this stuff. But of course, from a, again, microphysical point of view, it's very hard to vary the electron mass at the electron watt scale without screwing up all kind of you know, physics that we know, okay? So I would caution you against taking this seriously. And in fact, there are newer papers that actually rule out also from a phenomenological point of view using PBM data, this varying electron mass. So you can basically throw this varying electron mass idea uh, away. And then you are left with new early dark energy. Uh, and the old early dark energy model, of course, also do well. And then a third proposal, which is the Marion model, it doesn't do as well if you look at the chi squares. And with the later data, the difference in the chi squares are even bigger. So the Marion model is not as good as the new early dark energy model, but it's still pretty good. But as I will tell you, the Marion model is, in fact, automatically included into the hot new early dark energy model when we, when we look at this later. Okay. So I'm going to advertise now the hot new early dark energy model and explain it to you and show that the hot new early dark energy model actually combines a lot of these good features uh, into a single framework. Okay. So hot new early dark energy. Um, so we looked at a you know, scalar field in triggered phase transition where we needed this additional light scalar field. The idea is now that um, that if the phase transition is instead triggered by the temperature in the dark sector, we don't need this additional light scalar field. Uh, and then that means that, um, that there is only one scale in the problem, which is the temperature in the dark sector at the phase transition. So we really only have the EV scale, okay? We don't need the extra light scale to trigger the phase transition. So the hot new early dark energy is more natural compared to kind of standard physics you know, we kind of know thermal induced phase transitions a lot from the lab, right? We know electroweak phase transition, QCD phase transition, recombination, and so on. While uh, vacuum induced phase transitions, we only know them from basically in, in inflation, right? So, so the cold NADE is more inflation-like, while the hot NADE is more like uh, particle physics as we as we know it from from the lab. Okay. So, and as I said, uh, since we get rid of the extra trigger mass, there is only one scale in the problem, which is the EV mass scale. And that makes us also really, you know, it really begs for the question, is the Hubble tension a signature of how neutrinos got their mass, right? Because the EV scale can be, is close to, to the neutrino uh, mass scale, okay? Um, so, uh, so that's something that I will discuss in a minute. But first, let me just uh, remind uh, how the hot NADE model looks. Okay, so again, it's a first order phase transition and a scalar field potential. So you have the NADE boson. We call the, we, we, so the NADE boson is the psi field. Yeah, I'm sorry for that, but you know, we, we ran out of breed letters at some point. So, uh, it, you know, so, but anyway, so it's the boson, right? It's like uh, the Higgs boson. It just happens at the EV scale in the dark sector instead of, uh, you know, at the, you know, 100 GV scale in the visible system, right? And it's a first order phase transition. Uh, and so we have a tunneling event in our, you know, thermally corrected uh, scalar field potential that nucleates bubbles of the true vacuum. The story from before is the same. The phase transition is fast. It's triggered by temperature. So the phase transition is fast. Uh, we introduce anis we the the, the, the bubble collisions uh, leads to anisotropic stress that uh, in the tensor part of it is gravitational radiation and the vector part and, and other parts of it uh, it, it behaves like uh, anisotropic uh, stress that st is anisotropic stress that decays like uh, or shear stress if you want that decays like a stiff fluid. So we have this we have the same kind of background uh, level evolution, but at the Perturbation level is slightly different because the trigger is, is the temperature in the dark sector, okay? So here is the scalar field model. It's a usual kind of temperature corrected scalar field. Um, we want to be in the limit where the radiation is subdominant compared to the uh, vacuum energy of the scalar field, which means that we are uh, uh, in, in a different limit than the usual limit. We are in the limit where um, um, where we cannot use the kind of simple usual uh, finite temperature potential, but we need uh, a more general form uh, that that is valid also when the dark tem the, the temperature of um, 
of, of the dark uh, sector is uh, is is uh, subdominant um, compared to the vacuum energy. And so this is the correct temperature corrected um, scalar uh, field potential, uh, where TD is the temperature of the dark sector. Um, and just to to stay, so so the temperature here as a drop can introduce a first order phase transition. Uh, and just to say that there is now a kind of complete precise map between the microphysical model and the phenological model that we fit to the CMB. So by fitting cosmological data, we can constrain the underlying microphysical model, okay? So at the microphysical level, we have the, uh, a dimensional uh, um, uh, um, dimensionalist parameter that characterize uh, the, the shape of the, of the potential. We have the, the critical temperature of the phase transition, and we have uh, the, the ratio of the dark temperature to the visible temperature, and we have the number of gauge bosons and the, the coupling of the gauge bosons in, in the dark uh, sector, okay? That gives rise to the temperature corrected potential, okay? And then in the phenological model that, that this leads to that we can fit to the CMP, uh, we have the, this leads to a, a fraction of new early dark energy, a decay time. So the fraction of new early dark energy is, is given by the, the potential parameters on the, in the microphysical model. The decay time is given by the critical temperature. The number of effective relativistic degrees of freedom is given by the, by the temperature of the dark sector. And there is a drag force with, with dark matter uh, that is given by the bosons, the massive ghost bosons in the model and so on. So we have a microphysical model where we, which we can relate to observable uh, parameters in, in cosmology. Okay, so we can really constrain the microphysics using cosmology. Okay, and here's how the different parameters relate uh, between each other. Okay, so this is super exciting. I mean, we can do particle physics, very precise particle physics of the dark sector using uh, cosmology. Okay, so, I mean, this is super exciting, right? Um, so, uh, so these are new parameters in the hot new early dark energy compared to the cold new early dark energy, right? Since we have a temperature in the dark sector, we now have uh, 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 new degrees of freedom in the in the phenological model, which is the number of effective degrees of relativist the effective relativistic degrees of freedom, and this dark matter uh, drag force that comes from the bosonic uh, uh, gauge bosons in in the dark sector. Okay. Uh, and, and I just want to, to, um, to mention that exactly these ingredients are what gives you the potential to solve also the S8 problem and, and the possible, you know, non, they are not really like, you know, Lambda CDM also have this kind of uh, Sigma 8 problem, but this model actually now have the potential to, to also improve on that point uh, over Lambda CDM, okay? So we can really, I mean, this model has a lot of potential uh, and, and looks very promising in this sense, okay? Also, uh, theoretically, it looks very interesting and promising in the sense that um, we only have this new one new scale, which is the EV scale. And, and this, you know, begs this question of, you know, whether the Hubble tension is a signature of how neutrinos got their masses. And in fact, uh, I really believe this is, this is possible, okay? We may really be, be seeing uh, the effect of, of how neutrinos uh, achieved their masses in a phase transition, much like the other particles of the standard model obtained their masses in the electric phase transition. Okay, so uh, this can happen if we consider the inverse seesaw mechanism, uh, which kind of like in a one generational form uh, looks like this, where we have. Um, um, a mass term for the neutrinos that with a mass matrix that looks like I depicted here. So we have uh, three scales in the inverse seesaw mechanism. We have the electroweak scale, which is called D. Then we have a super electroweak scale, a, a TV scale, say, which is called N. And then we have a light scale, which could be the EV to up to GV scale, which is the mass of a sterile neutrino um, uh, in this model. Okay. So um, so the idea here is that the electroweak phase transition generates the D term, the, the, the electroweak uh, scale here. And sorry. Um, and then there is a new UV scale that could be connected to, to say dark matter. And then there's the new IR scale, which is the new early dark energy 
phase transition. Okay, so this uh, sterile uh, marijuana mass uh, is generated by the VEF of the NADE boson. Okay, the newly dark NADE boson, just like the VEF of the Higgs leads to the to the D term here, right? So that means that we can implement this in particle physics by assuming a, a, a dark symmetric group of the form GD times GNEDE, where GD is the symmetric group that is broken at the, um, at, at, yeah, okay. So it's the dark, uh, it's a dark gauge group that is broken at the super TV scale. So that, that is what generates the N scale here, the TV scale. And then there is a, another uh, symmetry group, the NEGE gauge group, um, that is broken at, at the IR scale and leads to the sterile mass. Okay. Um, so we assume that the dark symmetry group has this form. We have the GG broke, uh, GG symmetry, the dark gauge symmetry group, if you want, uh, broken at, uh, at around uh, the TV scale, generating the N entry in the inverse seesaw mechanism. Uh, that could be some new dark Higgs TV, dark Higgs field. Then we have the electroweak phase transition that generates the D scale in the inverse seesaw mechanism. And then we have, of course, the IR scale, which is the uh, EV scale, which is uh, induced by or uh, generated by uh, the NEDE phase transition as the NEDE gauge boson acquires a mass at the EV scale. Okay. And uh, we can achieve this kind of symmetry breaking pattern by this kind of Lagrangians. Uh, if we uh, with the correct assign uh, charge assignments, um, so if we have these Yukata uh, couplings and we assign charges charges uh, accordingly, uh, then then we can achieve this kind of symmetry breaking pattern. And just to be specific, we we worked out a specific example which we think is kind of like a kind of I think it's kind of like a minimal example of this. Sorry, okay, I just want before being very specific. I just want to mention that in this setup, there's this very nice matching between the mass of the sterile neutrino that leads to the, okay, so let me just uh, remind you that in the new, in the, in the inverse seesaw mechanism, this is like a, an idea that has been around for 30 years. And it's a kind of standard way of generating neutrino masses where um, once you diagonalize the mass matrix, you get the correct oscillating oscillation and mass pattern for, for the active neutrinos. Okay. So we know that, you know, that this mass matrix can explain uh, all the neutrino data as we know them also today. I mean, uh, by, <clears throat> by having uh, these right wing, right handed neutrinos and still right neutrinos in addition to the active neutrinos and then diagonal, the diagonalizing mass matrix. Of course. And, um, and, and, and I just wanted to mention that in, in this inverse seesaw mechanism, once we, once we relate the mass of the sterile neutrino in the inverse seesaw to the NED gauge boson width, then we can relate the mass of the sterile neutrino to the fraction of new early dark energy that we observe in cosmology, okay? <coughs> so this is super nice because we can actually now, by the Hubble tension and our solution to the Hubble tension, constrain parameters in the inverse seesaw mechanism, okay? So neutrino physics, okay? I mean, I think this is like a super nice connection, okay? And super non-trivial. Uh, and in fact, um, we also have a letter out where we point out, uh, and in fact, there will be a new version of this letter, which is, you know, just accepted for publication, basically, which will, um, which will, which will make this, uh, which makes this thing very precise, okay? Okay, so um, so I I promised you a, a, a precise example of the charge assignments of the gauge group. I mean, a, a precise choice of the gauge group and charge assignments that that realizes these Yukata couplings. And kind of a minimal example is if you we choose uh, the the GD the dark uh, uh, gauge group to be the a dark electric gauge group. So basically, uh, SU two cross U uh, one. And then we choose um, um, uh, the, the, the new early dark energy gauge group to be uh, basically uh, a global one lepton number, okay? Uh, so it's not a gauge group, it's a, it's a global symmetry group lepton number just. Um, of course, one can gauge it, but it's not necessary here, okay? Um, 
So we can then, then write down the, the Lagrangian and, and we can choose uh, to introduce a, <clears throat> a dark Higgs duplet, which is the phi one, which is the high energy one. So that's the one that is um, acquiring a diff at the TV scale. And then we have a triplet, a dark Higgs triplet uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the dark SU uh, electric gauge group which is the NADE boson, okay? And then we have a sterile uh, neutrino is duplet, which is a duplet under the dark electroweak. It's a lepton duplet under the dark electroweak. Okay? Uh, so here, uh, the myron, as I promised, appears naturally as the goldstone of the broken uh, U1 lepton number, which is, uh, uh, and it, it and, um, and, yeah, and so quantum gravity effect, I mean, since we don't have global symmetries in quantum gravity, it can have uh, an explicit breaking as well from quantum gravity that will give it, the, the, will, will give the Maron a small mass, okay? Uh, and then we have a, a secret interaction, if you want, uh, between the sterile neutrinos and our NAD gauge boson. And that is actually something that was pointed out quite a long time ago, that um, if you have a EV sterile neutrino, for instance, then you need the secret interaction to make it compatible with uh, with cosmology, okay? In order for for uh, to to, uh, to to avoid full thermalization okay? of the neutrinos, uh, so to avoid so there are constraints similar to the constraints on the um, uh, relativistic degrees of freedom that uh, from cosmology that kind of forces you to in introduce this kind of coupling to be compatible with cosmology if you have. Uh, an EV sterile neutrino. It should be said that in the inverse seesaw model, you don't need to have a physical uh, EV sterile neutrino in the spectrum. It could be that um, it depends on, on the exact uh, number of, uh, of right-handed uh, neutrinos in the, in the inverse seesaw, whether there is a physical EV sterile neutrino or whether in, in, the, in the spectrum, or whether it, it disappears once you diagonalize the, the inverse seesaw. Um, mass matrix, but certainly it's possible. Okay, so here's the charge assignments of the different fields. So we have the sterile uh, lepton doublet under the dark electric. We have the right-handed uh, uh, neutrino. We have the duplet, uh, the phi duplet under the dark electric. We have the NADE uh, triplet under the dark electric. We have the usual Higgs uh, which is a singlet under the dark electric. We have a possible dark matter uh, candidate, chi, uh, which could be charged under the dark uh, electric. And we have um, um, a little number, okay. Um, um, and, and here is the, the potential for the NADE field. And, uh, you know, we have, um, we can check that it's technically natural and can lead to a thermal uh, correct and, and lead to a thermal induced uh, phase transition uh, with the, the right choices of uh, gauge parameters and couplings and so on. Okay. So there is, uh, so there is, I mean, yeah, so yes, I mean, uh, it's so, so the thermal corrections that drives the, the, um, the thermal induced phase transition, uh, the NED phase transition is, is in the potential, is in the degrees of freedom here. And it's the F parameters that, that control the strength of the, of the phase transition. Uh, and as I, as I mentioned, uh, you can add, uh, okay, so here you can add an uh, explicit lepton number violation that gives a mass to the marron uh, uh, in this way. Okay, so this is a picture of the model. So you have the dark electric uh, group sitting at the TV scale in the dark side here on the right. Um, and you have the uh, dark electric uh, Higgs duplet and a possible uh, uh, dark matter candidate, the chi. Then on the left at the 100 GV scale, uh, you have the visible Higgs um that is connected uh, so so yeah so these uh, horizontal lines are the connections between the dark and the visible sector so uh, we had the um, we had the dn and um sterile mass scales right so we so we had the um the n uh, you know the yeah the the bridge yeah so we had the the mixing between right-handed and and um 
um, uh, and 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 um, left-handed neutrinos um, induced by the, the interim, right? Um, and then we had the um, and we had the um, and then we have the, the the connection here. The sorry, I, I switched the slide. But we have the uh, the d d uh, the d term in the mass mixing term uh, at the least weak scale there also connecting visible and dark sector. And then we have uh, on the right hand side at the EV scale, we have the new early dark energy gauge boson um, that, that triggers the NADE phase transition that gives mass to the sterile neutrino connecting uh, to the visible sector through uh, the lepton number violation uh, that happens at, at that scale. And that gives rise when we diagonalize the inverse CISO matrix that gives rise to the masses of the active neutrinos at the milli electron volt scale, right? So, so this is like a complete picture of, of the visible and dark sector and how they are connected in a way that resolves the Hubble tension uh, um, as the neutrinos acquire mass uh, in the new dark energy phase transition. Okay? Uh, so, um, so this is a, it's a very detailed model. It's an example of a, a, a you know, a, of a precise model that can basically explain uh, all these nice physics, like how neutrinos got their mass and how the Hubble tension is a signature of how neutrinos achieve their mass in the NED phase transition. Martin, okay. Martin we yes. run a little bit uh, out of time. Okay, Maybe I will finish summarize now. the results. Yes, absolutely. And if there are skeptical people, we, we may we may discuss this after after the uh, colloquium sure. as well. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So so this is a complicated model. It contains a lot of new degrees of freedom uh, that leads to, and it contains uh, some phenological uh, parameters: the dark temperature that we can compute in this model, the new uh, relativistic degrees of freedom that we can compute, and the fraction of new early dark energy that we can compute and connect to the microphysics of the model. And, and constrain from, from cosmology, okay? So we can constrain and, 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 and uh, this model from cosmology. And also we have in the model, in order to have this you know, fast phase transition that can explain the Hubble tension, we also have prediction for what the parameters should be that can in the future be tested from particle physics experiments and future cosmological experiments. So this model is a very kind of you know, precise framework for explaining all this, which makes prediction predictions for uh, cosmology and particle physics that can be tested in the future, okay? Um, so let me, uh, okay, I don't know, uh, somehow, yeah, there it comes. Okay, so let me just then go to the conclusions. So the Hubble tension could be explained by a fast triggered phase transition in the dark sector. Uh, and it could be a signature of how neutrinos got their mass, cold and hot, uh, NADE are uh, phenomenally promising uh, uh, models with a lot of uh, potential, um, and um, yeah, and and I yeah okay, and I talked about this. I mean, we have this prediction. Of, you know, there are many ways. I mean, in fact, this list is too short. I mean, there are many ways to probe and, and test this model in the future. It's a very precise framework. Um, um, of course, there is. Uh, it is a framework. So of course, now depends on how you implement this new early dark energy phase transition, whether it's cold NADE or hot NADE, but if you really want to, to connect it to particle physics and explain the origin of neutrino masses, it becomes a very precise and testable framework that, uh, that is very interesting for the future. But even NADE itself, cold NADE or hot NADE, so be it, will be uh, testable in the future in the sense that its prediction for the precise perturbations will be testable with future CMB or last case structure mentions. Okay? So there is a lot of things to do. There's a lot of things to understand, but in the essence, we have a very promising framework, which is testable and predictable, okay? uh, or have, have, you know, have predictions. Okay? And so that's, that's the upshot here. So let me stop there then, yeah. Oh, okay, thank, thank you, Martin, very much uh, for, for very interesting talk. There is a lot of uh, presumably questions uh, to, to be asked and discussed. Uh, but uh, if someone you know uh, can't stay uh, up until you you are free to leave, but uh, the floor for the question is open.
Yes, I see the hands up. Okay, can you please un unmute yourself and ask question? Okay, maybe um, I can. Uh, my, my, Michael, yes, please. Yeah, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, so uh, at the end, you mentioned that you could actually do without a physical EV scale sterile neutrino in the spectrum. I didn't quite understand that because I thought the EV scale was essential to your model. Maybe yes, the EV scale. Sorry, the EV scale is there, but when it depends on the on the precise number of uh, of, of right-handed neutrinos in the in the model, whether it remains in the physical spectrum once you diagonalize the mass matrix. Okay. So it's, so that it's is, there in the mass matrix before diagonalizing, but mm -hmm. once you diagonalize to get the to the, get the masses of the you know the, in the mass eigenbasis of the active neutrinos, okay. it depends on on you know the number of uh, of, uh, of of of, of right-handed and so on whether you know it, it remains as a as a light degrees of freedom mm -hmm. in the in the diagonal uh, representation. Okay. So, so that's your escape route to evade limits from light sterile neutrino searches. Except that, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, it's it can be there, but it can also not be. I mean, it's just how it is. I mean, uh, I mean, it's not really an escape. I mean, it's it's just that there is not a you know rigid prediction of necessarily having to have a, a EV scalar neutrino in the physical uh, spectrum. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, but it can be there. Okay, but also if it is there, you know, you need these interactions, these secret interactions to be in agreement with cosmology, okay? So there are, if you go back like 10, 15 years, okay, there are papers in the literature that EV sterile neutrino is already ruled out by cosmology. Uh, and that is true if you don't have this secret interaction, okay? And the point here is that the new early dark energies boson automatically gives the secret interaction yeah. when it gives the mass to the sterile, okay? So that, yeah, that's, that's kind of like... Too. Yeah. But un unfortunately, I cannot make the prediction that the sterile has to be there. That that is, uh, I mean, it can be there. Okay, uh, yeah. yeah, it would have been nice, of course, if we could say that it has to be there, right? I mean, uh, uh, then it means you just have to look hard, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. All right, Chris, please go ahead. Oh, thanks. Nice talk. Um, I was wondering, isn't it uh, a little concerning though that you have to have the space transition? right before um, uh, decoupling, you know, when there's no real uh, relationship between the physics of the phase transition and the decoupling physics? Um, I don't understand your question. So what's the problem here? Uh, what, what, what the, I, mean, I didn't so, really... so you're wondering about the, the, the timing. I mean, I mean, the coincidence problem, whether the e, by the EV scale, how that arises here. Okay, that's, that's your question, right? Yes. Yes, so that's in fact why we thought about uh, connecting it to the neutrino masses, right? Okay. Because it's the it's the neutrino mass scale that gives you the scale of the phase transition and the hot energy, right? Uh, so yeah, so if you uh, if that neutrino mass uh, connection turned out not to be correct, then. Uh, then yes, so uh, the you're code, concerned about your uh, the fine tuning. Yeah. So in front, yeah. So you could, you, I mean, in the cold NEDE model before starting talking about neutrinos and so on, you could ask exactly your questions, right? Why, why is there a phase transition exactly at the EV scale in, in the dark sector, right? And that's the question we try to answer by connecting it to the explanation of the origin of neutrino masses. There is another answer which is what we kind of like already mentioned in the cold NED paper, which is the first paper we put out a long time ago. I mean, not long time, but two and a half year ago or something like that. And that is the, the landscape, okay? So in fact, you expect to have frequent phase transitions if the landscape is the solution to the cosmological constant problem, okay? And, and you need the, the spacing of those phase transitions to be not too, too, uh, too large in order to, to really solve the, the CC problem, okay? And that is what, uh, for instance, uh, Gustav Lingler and uh, Katie Fries then elaborated on by the chain uh, NED model. Okay, that in that case it could be connected to how we solve the the CC problem. Okay. Uh, but then, wouldn't you have other phase transitions that would then yes. uh, need to be kind of yeah, but, but they will not be visible in the CMP, so we wouldn't know of them. Okay, so in their sorry, in their model, okay, in their model they have a large number of phase transitions, so. I mean, their model is a little bit, uh, I mean, they, yeah, okay, so their model, 
is a little bit different from 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 what I have in mind by having you know one phase transition happening once and there uh, in the universe in the history of the universe, uh, just lowering the CC uh, by many phase transitions. Okay, what they have is a, is a chain inflation model where they have uh, uh, they they go through many vacuums in the chain at the same time. Okay, so they have if you want a thousand phase transitions uh, making up. Uh, one effective phase transition, but that's a that's a detail in in how they implement uh, uh, you know the solution uh, in their model, okay, in their chain chain in NED model. But I mean, I think the, the the general way to think about it would be that you have the CC being very high naturally in the early universe after inflation, and then be lower it basically by many phase transition throughout the history of the universe. And if it never, if dark energy never gets to dominate, like it also doesn't do in our case. You would never see it, except from the one that happens when 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 it happens in the CMB. That's the one you would see, right? Oh, I see. Thank you. All right, uh, Mikael, please. Hey, thanks for a nice talk. Um, I have also a question about that last model which you showed about that hot in ED. Could you go back to the particle content when you showed that list? Okay, so okay, I, I don't think I understood everything. Mm properly when, when you went through. So, so just for me to understand, so, so S and Chi are fermions. Yes. L and H are basically standard model fields, right? Lepton doublet yeah. and Higgs doublet. Yeah. And yeah. UR is the right-handed neutrino. Right. Okay. So so there, there, I have two questions. So, so for one thing is, did you look at anomalies, um, whether all anomalies cancel in the dark sector? Uh, it's a good question. So we are looking at that. We haven't, as a, I mean, very, not very intensively. I mean, we have a side project, which is, uh, yeah, we thought about it, but we haven't, uh, you know, we haven't, uh, it's, it's a good question. My answer, my, my generic answer would be that anomalies, of course, if, if there are anom an anomalies, I mean, you can add multiplets to this, uh, true, to this true. model to, to fix them. Right. But, yeah, but yeah. my, my kind of, you know, my first answer will be no. No, we didn't check. But on mm -hmm. the other hand, generically, it shouldn't be a big problem. But it's an interesting possibility to check for and kind of think about if it forces you to add uh, other stuff to the model, mm -hmm. right? That's an it's a, it's a good question. Yeah. I mean, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and the other thing was about, okay, so you have those fermion mm -hmm. masses, right? So, so in that S, there are two components. So there's the neutrino, the sterile neutrino. Mm -hmm. And I as from Michael Glassen's question, of course, I understood then that mm -hmm. you form basically pseudo Dirac neutrinos with the right-handed neutrinos, mm -hmm. and they are heavy. But how about the charged component, also the the second component in the doublet? How does that pick up its mass? Yes. Um, so, and does it have uh, to be heavy or is it light? That's. Uh, no, I mean we can have. I mean we can have. Um, um, we can have some uh, light, uh, some light uh, um, dark fermions around if you want. Yeah, I mean, um, mm -hmm. um, uh, let me actually um, uh, let me just remember um, if we go back um, uh, to our. Um, um, Yes, so yes, I mean, um, so no, sorry, I think it will uh, it will acquire mass uh, in the in the first it, it will acquire TV mass in the first uh, because of the Higgs duplet, no, uh, the, the dark Higgs duplet, the the uh, TV one. Ah, uh, oh, so 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 yeah, it's yeah. A, so the, yeah. because of the phi, the phi, yeah. the dark Higgs duplet. Okay, yes. and, and there, okay, but you would need another particle then, right? Because it, it would you would need some. Uh, you're basically your dark electron. Yeah, I mean, it's a, right it it a possible uh, dark matter con candidate in your model, right? I mean, yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. okay, good. All right. maybe, Thanks. Maybe we stop recording, but Martin, if you have time and